If you could, please open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, please raise your hand and a leader will come bring you one. As that's happening, I just want to say it's good to see you all. Um, it's been two weeks, my family and I have been in California for two weeks on a research leave. But for most of you, the last time I saw you was actually at our high school winter retreat. Can I get like a, you if you went to that retreat? Woo! There we go, there we go. One of the reasons I was thinking about that retreat is because on that retreat, we played Kajabi Can Can, and I lost my voice that night. And I just learned, in playing it again, that my voice is still recovering. Uh, if you were on that retreat, raise your hand if you like caught that little cold, the post-camp cold a little bit. Yeah, we were all there those couple days. And some of you worse than others, I did not have it that bad, but nonetheless, my voice took a beating, and then, you know, I got like the cold in there, and California sun was good for me, but my voice is struggling a little bit tonight, so that's why I got my amazing Biola mug up here, and I might need to sip from it a couple times tonight to get through this sermon, so I'll ask you to bear with me in that. My voice is still recovering, but on to more serious topics, we are continuing our series through First Peter, and I'm really looking forward to tonight's passage, and I hope you have seen a theme woven through the past couple sermons that we have preached through on Wednesdays. If you look back just in your Bible, just one page, to chapter 2, uh, I hope that you remember a couple weeks ago, that's about, about a month ago now, when I taught through uh, 1 Peter 2, starting in verse 13, when Peter says this, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Dun, dun, dun. And we talked about what does it mean to submit to the governments, the authorities that God has put over us. Especially how do we submit and live under those authorities, submit under those authorities, when those authorities are corrupt, when they don't believe in God or they're not Christian, when they're teaching other things, how do we as Christians conduct ourselves in those sorts of places when we're in these sorts of roles? And then last week, Mackenzie brought us the word and and, and I, I didn't hear it yet. I haven't got a chance to listen to it yet, but I hope he taught on how servants, how do servants, slaves, how do they submit to their slave owners? How do they submit to the authorities that God has put over them, especially when they're mean owners, when they're not friendly owners. How do Christians submit to authorities that are over them, especially how do they submit to the authorities over them when those authorities aren't Christians, when they're not walking with the Lord, when they're not nice people? What do we do? And remember, just backing up even farther, the reason first or the reason Peter is writing this letter to the church is because we are no longer like the rest of the world. We don't conduct ourselves like the rest of the world conducts ourselves. We live differently. Why? Because we're sojourners and saints. We are God's elect exiles in this world, and so we live differently, and we need to follow not the rules of the world, but God's rules. And especially in these sorts of relationships when when Christians find themselves submitted to unruly, unchristlike leadership, it kind of gets tricky. How do we submit ourselves to leaders when our leaders aren't good people, when our leaders aren't following Jesus? The, this is the question that Peter is seeking to answer in this section of his letter, and we're seeing that continue tonight when we get to 1 Peter 3, verses 1 through 7. And tonight, specifically, we are going to talk about how, primarily, we're going to talk about how wives submit to their husbands. And you, if you've been in church before, you've probably heard something to the degree that husbands are the leaders in their families, they're the leaders of their homes, and wives are to submit and follow them. And that might raise a whole bunch of questions to you because the world doesn't like that message today. And if you want to talk about that more, you better stick around because we are going to talk about gender roles and what it means to be a man and a woman in this real world. This summer, we have a special series planned. That's one of the things I was researching in California. And we're gonna talk about sexuality, gender, marriage, the gospel, how all those things work together. And so tonight we're gonna talk about one specific application of that theology. So we're not gonna understand it fully or even seek to talk about what does it mean to be a man and a woman in marriage. Those 
More specifically, we're going to talk about that this summer, so you can look forward to that then. But tonight, nonetheless, we're talking about that subject, husbands and wives. And in just a second, when I read this text, you're going to see, I think you're going to see, I believe you're going to see, a predicament that some wives were in in the early church. Because remember, we're talking about corrupt authorities and how do we submit to those authorities. And here's what was happening in this context that this letter was written is there were wives who were believing the gospel, coming to know Jesus, and their husbands were not. Their husbands were pagans, Greco-Roman Gentiles, believing all sorts of other gods, participating in all sorts of evil things. And so there becomes the question, how do wives submit to those husbands? How do they remain faithful to the men that they've married while remaining faithful to their newfound religion, their new Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? How do these wives conduct themselves in marriage? And that's specifically what Peter's addressing to tonight. But as we come to his word, we do find principles, good God-ordained principles for all husbands and wives and how husbands and wives should treat one another. And so, though I don't believe any of us here are married to a non-Christian, so that doesn't directly apply to us. And most of you students, all of you students aren't married yet. So you're like, okay, that doesn't apply to me. But here's the thing. There are good gospel biblical truths about marriage that we need to see tonight and that I believe you need to see tonight. Here's why. I believe that most of you will probably be married someday or at least pursue getting married someday. Not all of you. You don't have to get married. And and some of you may decide that you don't want to do that. But most of you at least will probably try to get married. And God wants to start preparing you to be a good spouse today. That's why this youth group exists. This youth group exists to equip the saints, that's you, young saints, for the work of ministry, like Paul says in Ephesians 4. And if you decide to get married one day, your biggest ministry, your main ministry is going to be to your spouse. And so part of the reason this youth group exists is to prepare you for future ministry. And if you desire to get married one day, you need to start preparing now. God wants to mature you now to get you ready for that. And so, you need this passage just as much as I need this passage. So, if you guys at all are interested in getting married, or even if you're not, you're going to have married friends and you're going to need to hold them accountable. So, we all need to learn what God's good design for marriage is. And so, I wanted to just take an, ex- wanted to take an extended time to make that clear because you might read this passage here in a second and you're like, that doesn't apply to me. I'm going to check out for the rest of tonight. <laughs> But here's here's the truth of God's word. It's living, it's active, and every time we come to God's word, whether it's the New Testament, Old Testament, whether we're in Lamentations or Revelation, Jesus is there ready to meet us. And I believe if you pay attention tonight, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you will see Jesus in this text. And we all need Jesus, desperately. I don't know what the past 48 hours or 24 hours or 12 hours has been like for you, but if, just speaking from experience, I need Jesus right now. I desperately need him. I need him to feed my soul. I'm hungry. And I need the word. And so let's pray to receive the word, and then I'll read our text. Pray with me. Father, as I, as we dive into this passage, would you feed our hungry souls? Would you reveal your gospel truth to us through these seven verses? And would we see your good design for marriage? And see how we are to conduct ourselves in relation to the opposite sex, even. And Father, we just rejoice that even though it's complicated in this world to try to figure out how to submit to these unruly, unfaithful, corrupt leaders, we rejoice that we get to submit to you, our perfect leader. We get to submit to Jesus, our King of kings, and in him there is no corruption. And so, Father, would all of us submit to him more faithfully as a result of this time? We pray in his name. Amen. 
First Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Follow along with me. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external. The braiding of your hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children. If you do good and do not fear anything, that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as, weaker, as the weaker vessel, see, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Amen. This is the word of our Lord. First point that we need to see in this text tonight is this. Wives follow the lead of their husbands. That's what Christian wives do. That's what good wives do. It's how God designed it to be. Wives follow the lead of their husbands. This is how men and women in a marital covenant conduct themselves. And the New Testament specifically gives very clear instructions for how men and women should conduct their relationships with one another, specifically in the church and in the family and in the home. And, he, and there's very specific rules and guidelines that you and I are to follow and obey and walk in, in our distinctness, in our difference, differences. In the church and in the family, we need to abide by God's ways. And what God has designed to be in marriage is for wives to follow the lead of their husbands. This is the teaching of the Bible. And like I said, come this summer, we're going to really dig in to that good design. We're going to start in Genesis and go through the whole Bible, and we're going to seek to understand how and why and for what purpose God designed gender distinction, gender roles for. We're going to get into all of that, but tonight, look what we see in verse 1. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. Follow the lead of your husbands. In the family, husbands are the leaders. They're in charge of setting the mission and direction of the family. And they say, follow me as I take us down this road. And wives are to follow them. Follow their lead. But remember who Peter is talking to. Remember what I talked about in the beginning. As you can imagine, this call for women to follow their husbands, follow the lead of their husbands, can be tricky for a lot of reasons, can be difficult for a lot of reasons, especially when their husbands aren't Christians. When their husbands don't know the God of all life and all goodness and all love, how does a woman do that faithfully when their husband's a jerk, when he's mean, when he doesn't know Jesus and doesn't love them properly? Look at, look at what Peter says in verse one. So that even if some do not obey the word, some husbands, some of your husbands may not obey the word always. They won't always obey the word. I don't always obey the word. Your pastors, your leaders, your, your fathers don't always obey the word, but, but specifically here in this text, Peter is referring to those who never obey the word, those who are not walking with Christ, that are following a different religion than Christianity. Man, for those women, for those Christian women, just imagine for a second how difficult that might be. It'd be pretty hard. It'd be pretty hard in today's world, even. But here's the thing, 2,000 years ago in the Greco-Roman world where they worshiped pagan idols, 
and they were a lot more misogynistic than we are today, and men were these oppressive leaders in their homes generally, women had no rights, no say-so. And the expectation for all women in this culture was that you shut up and you do what your husband says. He says worship that idol, you worship that idol. That was the expectation for women in this culture. And so see how radical Peter's letter is here. You might hear this and be like, what? We're supposed to submit to our husbands? But, but, but you all have to read between the lines. Peter is giving these women permission to worship the one true God. He's giving them permission to defy the cultural rules that were on them and say, even though your husband doesn't worship God, you still can You can still follow him. You can still abide in Jesus. And here's how. Here's how you can follow Jesus in a culture that's working against you, in a marriage that's working against you even. This is God's expectation for you, that you would continue to submit to your husband even when your husband is not a believer. Why? Why would they do that? Why would women submit to their husbands when their husbands aren't believers? Look at the end of verse one. That they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, that they may be won for Jesus. That they may see the conduct of their wives, the purity of their heart, the holiness that they have in Jesus, the love that they have in Jesus, and as they continue to follow their husbands and submit to them to a degree and respect their sinful, unchristian husbands, their husbands would be won for Jesus. Their husbands would know Jesus and come to Jesus. Notice what this isn't saying. It's not saying that it's the wife's job to like scream the gospel at their husband and preach to them day in and day out with their words. No, Peter is saying, women who are married to unbelieving husbands, you proclaim the gospel to them through your life, through your actions, through your conduct, by submitting to them. Look at verse five. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands. Wives are supposed to submit to their own husbands. And the hope in doing that is that their husbands will see their holy character and come to know Jesus as a result. And Peter gives us this brilliant, amazing example of how women did this in the Old Testament by mentioning the relationship between Sarah and Abraham. Sarah, the wife of the patriarch Abraham, the father of our faith, submitted to him and obeyed him and followed him even when he led her to do dumb things. Let her to lie, let her, let her, let her to, to, in, in, to, to be captured by other kings and rulers and be taken away from her. She obeyed. And Peter's saying, be a wife like that. Submit to your husband like that. Obey him like Sarah obeyed Abraham. Call him Lord. And look what, look what he says. You are her children. Christian wives, submit, when you submit to your husbands, you are children of Sarah. You're doing what God has designed you to do. And here's the logic here. Most of you, I, I, I think at this point, I know most of you, you guys know the story of Abraham and Sarah. And Abraham is the leader of our faith. He's the leader of our faith family. And he called Abraham to father a nation. And he called Sarah to follow Abraham. That was the order of the relationship. God called Abraham to be the leader, and he called Sarah to follow Abraham. Sarah, follow Abraham as Abraham follows the Lord. 
He's going to take you to do some crazy things. But if you trust Abraham and you obey Abraham, you're actually trusting God. You're actually trusting me, is what God is saying. God gives women their husbands to be their leaders, even when their husbands are not Christians, even when their, crush, their husbands are not walking with the Lord. And, and Peter is acknowledging how difficult this can be. He recognizes, especially for women who are married to unbelievers, this is tricky. This is a form of suffering. That's why he's comparing it to like being enslaved by a slave master. He's comparing it to being submitted to a, an evil government that's enforcing evil rules and making Christians suffer. Christian wives who are married to unbelievers suffer. Their life is difficult. But nonetheless, God wants them to obey. Peter is telling wives to obey their husbands when it's uncomfortable, even when they think their husbands are wrong. Being married to an unbeliever is an extreme form of suffering. And and just imagine for a second how mean these Greco-Roman Gentile husbands probably were. Even before their wives dishonored them by following a different religion, they were probably abusive, neglected, unloved, they weren't, didn't have a deep emotional uh, uh, attachment to their spouse. And then their wife goes off and follows another religion. Can you imagine how cruel most of these husbands must have been to them? The jokes they said about them. The way their husband looked at them differently because of their new found faith. Nonetheless, Peter isn't, doesn't tell these wives to leave those husbands, to divorce them to rule over them. No, he says, submit and follow them so that they can know Jesus and follow me. But here's what this passage is not saying. It's not saying that wives just shut up and put up with abuse. That's not what this passage is saying. There is nowhere here where Peter is teaching that wives just, just allow themselves to be abused emotionally, physically, sexually. No, that, there's no place for that for God's people. And if you are a wife in a relationship like that, you don't have to stay. You don't have to submit to that sort of leadership. And like we talked about a couple weeks ago, just like citizens of a country, we follow and obey the, the rules of an unruly government until that government tells us to disobey God. That's the breaking point. That's when we say enough is enough. And so if the government tells us to be liars and thieves, we say, no, I'm submitted to God ultimately, and God's law is different than your law, and so I'm not gonna lie and steal. That same principle applies to wives in marriage. If your Christian husbands or even your unchristian husbands tell you to do something that is in direct contrast with God's rule, wives, future wives, You do not have to submit to that sort of leadership. You fear God, ultimately. You submit to God, ultimately. And so, hear it clearly from his word. You do not have to submit to a husband that's abusive to you and that expects you to sin and live in contrast to God's word. That's not what this passage is saying. But what is it saying? then. Ultimately, this passage is teaching us that in God's kingdom, according to God's rule, the the way wives obey God is by obeying their husbands, by following their lead, by trusting them, even when they disagree with them. And please notice here, This is a command for wives. Wives submit to their husbands. Wives submit to men in this way, to their one and only husband in this way. Peter isn't giving a general rule for all women here. No, he's saying in the uniqueness of your unique family, in your unique relationship with your spouse, you submit to him. 
And let me tell you, we are living in a culture filled with men who do not know Jesus, who will not be your husband someday, and you don't just have to submit to them and do whatever they tell you to do. You don't have to follow their lead. No, you follow the lead of your elders and your husbands, women. That's who you follow. That's who you submit to. And ultimately, in submitting to those leaders, you submit to God. Coming back to this passage, he's talking to wives here. Wives, submit to your husbands. Follow their lead. Believe that God has called them to lead your family, to lead your marriage. And you demonstrate belief in God by obeying and following your husband. A big way women submit to their husbands, especially women in these complicated relationships with unbelieving men, the way that they're going to win them to Jesus is through the conduct of their life. And that's where this next command comes in, in verse 4. Remember, women of unbelieving husbands, wives of unbelieving husbands are going to win those husbands for Christ by living holy and upright lives. And that's where this next command comes in, in verse three, actually. Do not let, there's the command, do not do this. Do not let your adorning be external. The braiding of your hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet Spirit. Let's go back to verse 3. Do not, wives, do not let your adorning be external. Do not let your obsession, your biggest passion, the thing you focus on the most, be external. Now, this is also another huge cultural command. We, if you've ever seen like Greco-Roman statues from this time in history, from the first century, they were obsessed with the external body. They were obsessed with the physical beauty of humans. And so it was the expectation for women that the most important thing about them was their external beauty. And so only care about how you look physically. That was the message of the day back then. And I think that's, Sounds oddly familiar to me today. I think that's the message that our culture is telling you, women. Just care about your external beauty. You're, you're only as good and as valuable as you are physically pretty. That's the only thing that matters about you. And that is a lie that Peter is directly speaking against. And so if you believe that lie, if you think your physical beauty is the most important thing about you, let me speak to you directly. It's not. It's not true. The most important thing about you is that God made you in his image and he loves you. And if you are a female, if you're a woman, a young woman here today, you are beautiful. God thinks you're beautiful and he loves you and you are his daughter and you do not have to adorn, seek to obsessively seek to beautify your external uh, appearance. That's not what God cares about ultimately. But what does he care about? The hidden person of the heart. He cares about your soul. He cares about your inner beauty. And you, holistically, as a person, becoming more beautiful. That's what God cares about. And so that's what you should care about. You should seek to adorn that hidden person of the heart. Your deep inner being is what you should care about making more beautiful. It's not about the external appearance. Ultimately, that external appearance is going to fade, and you're going to get old and wrinkly, and it's it's not going to last forever. So don't waste your time constantly worried about your hair, about what you're wearing. Your main focus should be on your inner beauty. On your inner beauty. And, and hear me when I say, this passage is not saying don't care about your external appearance at all. No. I think we can glorify God through our external appearance. But it becomes a problem when, that, when it's our main focus. And so braid your hair. You can wear jewelry. Wear nice clothes. It's okay to want to present a clean, healthy 
mature look with your out, outside appearance. Because we all have eyes and we all see, see the external. But it's not the main thing. It's not the most important thing. I was thinking about this. I was thinking about um, my older brother and his relationship to cars when he first got into driving. My brother knows, still to this day, knows nothing about cars. And, and, it, and this was really uh, exemplified in his early days of driving because he only adorned the external appearance of his cars. He would wash his car all the time. And he would like go get cans of spray paint and like spray paint his rims so his cars looked really nice. But this happened multiple times. Like I went out and checked the oil in my brother's car and there was none. Like zero oil in his car's engine. And you don't have to know a lot about cars to understand that is a no-no. A car cannot run without oil, right? Because that's not the pur- the purpose of a car ultimately is to get you from point A to point B without the car blowing up on the side of the road. And certainly it's nice to have a clean car to take care of the things that God give, gives us. And so it's okay to try to preserve the outside appearance of your, of your car. But my brother was neglecting the most important part of his car, the engine, the thing that made it go. He neglected it. And so he went through quite a few cars his first couple years of driving until he learned, I should probably focus on what's in the car and not just on what's outside of the car. I can have the shiniest, coolest looking car in the world, but if it doesn't start, it's pointless. And so in a much bigger way, in a much more significant way, the call of this passage is to invest your time and energy on what's inside. On, what's, on, on what really counts. On your soul. And making your heart look more like Jesus. Wives, that's your call. Women, that's your call. And in fact, men, that's our call too. Don't be so self-obsessed with your external appearance that you let your inward being suffer and die. I think what these verses are telling us is to make growing in the knowledge of Jesus our main priority. Care about the hidden person of the heart and its beautification and its growth in holiness above all else. In other words, take your relationship with Jesus more seriously than anything else. That's what Peter's saying here. That's what he's teaching wives to do. And remember the context. Why? Well, yes, it's good for them to know and enjoy Jesus, and and that's the ultimate purpose of life, and worship him. But practically, as these women are married to unbelievers, it's that inward beauty that's going to draw their unbelieving husbands into a relationship with Christ. They're gonna see that inward being, beauty, hopefully, if the Spirit illuminates their minds, those husbands will see Jesus in their wives' hearts and they'll say, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I want that Jesus. I wanna know that Jesus. I wanna be beautiful like that Jesus. And so, we grow in holiness, to enjoy Jesus more, but but also so that unbelievers can see Jesus in us and they can grow too. That's Peter's message to the wives. And and, and you'll see an imbalance in in the verse we're about to read. Wives get six verses and husbands get one. Why is that? Well, remember, Peter is speaking to the Christians who are under oppressive authority in these passages, under unruly authority. And and in general, husbands were were in the place of authority, and so there's not directly related to everything Peter's talking about. But nonetheless, it's appropriate. He's talking about wives. He wants to give a a quick instruction to men too, and that's where we're going to land in our third and final point. Here it is. Husbands sympathize and honor their wives. Husbands sympathize and honor their wives. Wives. This is an important instruction 
for the church and for these people. Because in this culture, and I think in our culture today, it was pretty normal for men to mistreat, mistreat, undervalue, abuse their wives. It was, it was socially acceptable. But this is not how husbands should treat their wives. They should treat them with sympathy and empathy and careful treatment and honor them for who they are. Husbands need to pay, pay special and close attention to treat women with the care that they deserve. He's going to explain why. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman. Why? As the weaker vessel. Some of you, I can see your look on your face. Weaker vessel. What? Women are weaker? This is amongst the most controversial verses in our society today. Women are not weaker. What does Peter mean here? There's a lot of debate about this, and let me tell you at least what Peter means here when he says women are the weaker vessel. Peter is at least referring to physical weakness. In general, women are physically weaker than men. That's just a fact of biology. Men get stronger faster, and their strength capacity is physically is more than women. How do we know this? There's a lot of evidence for that. But, but, but let me tell you just one statistic. Some of you know I like lifting heavy things, and so this is a cool statistic to me. Listen, the strongest woman to ever live deadlifted 636 pounds. That's a lot. That's more than I can deadlift. What the deadlift is is there's a bar with weights on the side, and the woman bent down, picked the bar off the ground, and stood all the way up with it with 636 pounds. Crazy impressive. That's the strongest woman to ever live. But listen to how much the strongest man to ever live lifted. He actually lifted it during the pandemic. His name is Hathjord Bjornsson, a modern Viking of our day. His nickname is The Mountain, and he lifted 1,104 pounds off the ground. Oh, oh, that hurts. Nearly double the world record of women. And so I share that statistic, obviously it's fun and it's exciting, but, but in general, biologically, men have a, have a bigger capacity for strength than women. And so it is true, biologically true at least, that men in general are weaker than women. But what in the world does that have to do with marriage? <laughs> oh, sorry, I said it backwards. Men are stronger than women, biologically. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What does women being the weaker vessel, being physically weaker than their husbands, have to do with marriage? Why does that matter? Why are we talking about deadlifting and who can, who can lift more weight off the ground? Here, here, here's what you have to remember in this context and in our context today. And this is a, we're going to switch to a serious note here. One of the despicable sins of men in marriage is that they use their physical strength to threaten their wives to do what they want. Historically, men have abused their physically, physical strength to hurt women. Physically and verbally and emotionally, men can abuse their wives because of their physical strength. They can intimidate their wives in an unkind, unloving, abusive way. And please hear the Bible when it, as it is speaking directly against that behavior. There's no place for that in the Christian family. That's not what godly men do. Godly men do not abuse their strength in marriage. This is not how husbands are to lead. This is not how men are to lead. Not abusively, but empathetically. 
compassionately, sympathetically, in a way that honors women. Look at the rest of this verse. Why? Why do men do this? Since women, when he says they, he's talking about women. Since wives or women, they are heirs with you of the grace of life. They're heirs with you. They're co-equals with you. Hear this very clearly, friends. If you hear anything tonight. Men and women are equal in dignity and value and worth. Women, you are equally valuable as men. You are. Men are not more valuable than you. God values you equally with men. And yes, you have different roles. And you play different parts. But that does not mean that you are lesser. In fact, women are the weaker vessel, which means that they deserve more delicacy, more care, more value. Think of a delicate, beautiful vase that you put flowers in. You don't just throw a vase like that around. No, you handle it with care and gentleness to preserve its beauty. This is how we treat women. We honor them, we value their beauty, we respect them, we protect them. Women are equal in dignity, value, and worth. Women play an equally important role in God's kingdom. Just because they're not leading their family does not mean that they're lesser. So husbands, lead these equally important wives in a godly way, in an honoring way, in a loving way, in a compassionate way. Understand their needs and their opinions. And if you don't, there are huge consequences. Look at the end of verse 7. So that your prayers may not be hindered. You want God to listen to you, men? Respect women. Respect your wives. The Lord protects the vulnerable. He defends the weak. And let me scare you guys just a little bit. Let me scare you a little bit. Guys, you need to respect women and value them and treat them fairly. And since being at this church and being around some of you Young guys, I have heard some of the jokes you tell when women aren't around, some of the ways you talk about your sisters in Christ, not all of you, I don't want to implicate all of you, but some of you. You have talked about women, in, some of you even in front of me, in a way that's disrespectful. In the way that robs women of their dignity, value, and worth. And let me say clearly, there's no place for that in God's kingdom. Women deserve your respect, men. They deserve your love and your compassion and your protection. And here's the scary thing. When you make fun of them, when you dishonor them, you dishonor God's daughters, the creator of the universe's daughters. And I understand this like extra now that I'm a dad of a girl. And here's, let me tell you what I mean. Yeah, I can get angry and pissed off and defensive, but since my daughter's been born, and since I've been married, both of them, but especially my daughter, there is this deep, white hot fury of rage in my heart at the thought of someone disrespecting my daughter or hurting my daughter because it's my job to protect them. And you are fooling yourself if you think the God of the universe is gonna just stand by and let you disrespect his daughters, those sins will be punished and will be paid for. So Christian men, what do we do in light of that? What do we do in light of our father valuing women in this sort of way? We stand in front of them, we protect them, we lead them, we honor them, 
This is what men do. This is what godly men do. In marriage, men lead their wives. And so, how do we apply a passage like this today? Especially for those of you who aren't yet married. Women, find your identity in Jesus. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fun and it's good for you to find your style, what works for you, how to do your hair and makeup, all those things, those are fun and good and that's part of coming to age is you're figuring out what works for you in those things and that's important. But the most important thing about you is that you're made in God's image and he loves you and you're his daughter and he wants to see you beautified in the image of Christ and so take that seriously. Find your identity in Jesus. Cultivate a relationship with Jesus. Young men, though you are not married yet, you need to hear this call from God's word to honor, respect, value, and protect women. They need you to step up for them. And friends, men, women, future husbands, potentially future wives, whoever you are. You can rest that though we all have to submit in this life in one way or another to unruly, unfaithful, corrupted leaders, we have the perfect leader in Jesus. He is our king. He is our authority. And so as we seek to endure all the challenges, all the complexities of having to submit to bad leaders, sinful leaders, keep your eyes on the true leader. Keep your eyes on your true king because he will lead you safely home. He will protect you eternally. Submit to him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the clarity of this passage. And for the call of this passage for us, men and women, to demonstrate our gender distinctions in marriage. For for men to take the lead and for women to follow them and to obey their husbands insofar as they are abiding in your word. And Father, I, I, I just pray for the women in this youth group that they would value their heart being transformed more into the image of your son, more than they value anything else. That they tonight would wrestle with where they're finding their identity in and what they're putting their identity in. And if it's in anything other than you, would you reveal that to them? And would you ground them in your son Jesus and help them to know how loved and adored and cherished and beautiful they are in him? And Father, for these young men, would you help them to shake off their boyishness, their immaturity, and cause them to rise as the gospel-centered leaders you've called them to be. And would they respect, honor, and protect the woman in their lives. Father, would you just continue to teach us what it means to be your people in this lost and dying world. And as these students go and spend a few minutes in small groups debriefing this, would you be with them. I pray these things in his name. Amen.